Mademoiselle Pearl, of Guy de Maupassant. What a strange idea it was for me to choose Mademoiselle Pearl for queen that evening. Every year I celebrate Twelfth Night with my old friend Chantal. My father, who was his most intimate friend, used to take me round there when I was a child. I continued the custom, and I doubtless shall continue it as long as I live and as long as there is a Chantal in the world. The Chantals lead a peculiar existence. They live in Paris as though they were in Grasse, Yvetot, or pont a mousson They have a house with a little garden near the observatory. They live there as though they were in the country. Of Paris, the real Paris, they know nothing at all. They suspect nothing. They are so far, so far away. However, from time to time, they take a trip into it. Mademoiselle Chantal goes to lay in her provisions, as it is called in the family. This is how they go to purchase their provisions. Mademoiselle Pearl, who has the keys to the kitchen closet, for the linen closets are administered by the mistress herself, Mademoiselle Pearl gives warning that the supply of sugar is low, that the preserves are giving out, that there is not much left in the bottom of the coffee bag. Thus warned against famine, Mademoiselle Chantal passes everything in review, taking notes on a pad. Then she puts down a lot of figures and goes through lengthy calculations and long discussions with Mademoiselle Pearl. At last, they manage to agree, and they decide upon the quantity of each thing which they will lay in three months' provision. Sugar, rice, prunes, coffee, preserves, cans of peas, beans, lobster, salt or smoked fish, etc., etc., after which the day for the purchasing is determined on, and they go in a cab with a railing round the top and drive to a large grocery store on the other side of the river in the new sections of the town. Madame Chantal and Mademoiselle Pearl make this trip together, mysteriously, and only return at dinner time, tired out, although still excited and shaken up by the cab, the roof of which is covered with bundles and bags like an express wagon. For the Chantals, all that part of Paris situated on the other side of the Seine constitutes the new quarter, a section inhabited by a strange, noisy population which cares little for honor, spends its days in dissipation, its nights in revelry, and which throws money out of the windows. From time to time, however, the young girls are taken to the Opera Comique or the Theatre Francais when the play is recommended by the paper, which is read by Monsieur Chantal. At present, the young ladies are respectively 19 and 17. They are two pretty girls, tall and fresh, very well brought up, in fact, too well brought up, so much so that they pass by unperceived like two pretty dolls. Never would the idea come to me to pay the slightest attention or to pay court to one of the young Chantal ladies. They are so immaculate that one hardly dares to speak to them. One almost feels indecent when bowing to them. As for the father, he is a charming man, well-educated, frank, cordial, but he likes calm and quiet above all else, and has thus contributed greatly to the mummifying of his family in order to live as he pleased in stagnant quiescence. He reads a lot, loves to talk, and is readily affected. Lack of contact and of elbowing with the world has made his moral skin very tender and sensitive. The slightest thing moves him, excites him, and makes him suffer. The Chantals have limited connections carefully chosen in the neighborhood. They also exchange two or three yearly visits with relatives who live in the distance. As for me, I take dinner with them on the 15th of August and on Twelfth Night. That is as much one of my duties as Easter communion is for a Catholic. On the 15th of August, a few friends are invited, but on Twelfth Night, I am the only stranger. Well, this year, as every former year, I went to the Chantal's for my epiphany dinner. According to my usual custom, I kissed Monsieur Chantal, Madame Chantal, and Mademoiselle Pearl, and I made a deep bow to the Misses Louise and Pauline. I was questioned about a thousand and one things, about what had happened on the boulevards, about politics, about how matters stood in Tonking, and about our representatives in Parliament. Madame Chantal, a fat lady, whose ideas always gave me the impression of being carved out square like building stones, was accustomed to exclaiming at the end of every political discussion, all that is seed which does not promise much for the future. Why have I always imagined that Madame Chantal's ideas are square? I don't know, but everything that she says takes that shape in my head, a big square with four symmetrical angles. There are other people whose ideas always strike me as being round and rolling like a hoop. As soon as they begin a sentence on any subject, it rolls on and on, coming out in ten, twenty, fifty round ideas, large and small, which I see rolling along, one behind the other, to the end of the horizon. Other people have pointed ideas, but enough of this. We sat down as usual and finished our dinner without anything out of the ordinary being said. At dessert, the twelfth night cake was brought on. Now, Monsieur Chantal had been king every year. I don't know whether this was the result of continued chance or a family convention, but he unfailingly found the bean in his piece of cake, and he would proclaim Madame Chantal to be queen. Therefore, I was greatly surprised to find something very hard, which almost made me break a tooth and a mouthful of cake. 
Gently I took this thing from my mouth, and I saw that it was a little porcelain doll, no bigger than Bean. Surprise caused me to exclaim, Ah! All looked at me, and Chantal clapped his hands and cried, It's Gaston! It's Gaston! Long live the king! Long live the king! All took up the chorus, Long live the king! And I blushed to the tip of my ears, as one often does, without any reason at all, in situations which are a little foolish. I sat there looking at my plate with this absurd little bit of pottery in my fingers, forcing myself to laugh and not knowing what to do or say, when Chantal once more cried out, Now you must choose a queen. Then I was thunderstruck. In a second, a thousand thoughts and suppositions flashed through my mind. Did they expect me to pick one of the young Chantal ladies? Was that a trick to make me say which one I prefer? Was it a gentle, light, direct hint of the parents toward a possible marriage? The idea of marriage roams continually in houses with grown-up girls, and takes every shape and disguise, and employs every subterfuge. A dread of compromising myself took hold of me, as well as an extreme timidity before the obstinately correct and reserved attitude of the Misses Louise and Pauline. To choose one of them in preference to the other seemed to me as difficult as choosing between two drops of water, and then the fear of launching myself into an affair, which might, in spite of me, lead me gently into matrimonial ties, by means as wary and imperceptible, and as calm as this insignificant royalty? The fear of all this haunted me. Suddenly, I had an inspiration, and I held out to Mademoiselle Pearl the symbolical emblem. At first, everyone was surprised, then they doubtless appreciated my delicacy and discretion, for they applauded furiously. Everybody was crying, Long live the queen! Long live the queen! As for herself, poor old maid, she was so amazed that she completely lost control of herself. She was trembling and stammering, No, no, oh, not me, please, not me, I beg of you. Then for the first time in my life, I looked at Mademoiselle Pearl and wondered what she was. I was accustomed to seeing her in this house, just as one sees old upholstered armchairs on which one has been sitting since childhood without ever noticing them. One day, with no reason at all, because a ray of sunshine happens to strike the seat, you suddenly think, why, that chair is very curious, and then you discover that the wood has been worked by a real artist and that the material is remarkable. I had never taken any notice of Mademoiselle Pearl. She was a part of the Chantal family, that was all. But how? By what right? She was a tall, thin person who tried to remain in the background, but who was by no means insignificant. She was treated in a friendly manner, better than a housekeeper, not so well as a relative. I suddenly observed several shades of distinction which I had never noticed before, Madame Chantal said, Pearl, the young ladies, Mademoiselle Pearl, and Chantal only addressed her as Mademoiselle, with an air of greater respect, perhaps. I began to observe her. How old could she be? Forty? Yes, forty. She was not old. She made herself old. I was suddenly struck by this fact. She fixed her hair and dressed in a ridiculous manner, and, notwithstanding all that, she was not in the least ridiculous. She had such simple, natural gracefulness, veiled and hidden. Truly, what a strange creature! How was it I had never observed her before? She dressed her hair in a grotesque manner, with little old maid curls, most absurd, but beneath this one you could see a large, calm brow cut by two deep lines, two wrinkles of long sadness, then two blue eyes, large and tender, so timid, so bashful, so humble, two beautiful eyes which had kept the expression of naive wonder of a young girl, of youthful sensations, and also of sorrow, which had softened without spoiling them. Her whole face was refined and discreet, a face the expression of which seemed to have gone out without being used up or faded by the fatigues and great emotions of life. What a dainty mouth, and such pretty teeth, but one would have thought that she did not dare smile. Suddenly I compared her to Madame Chantal. Undoubtedly Mademoiselle Pearl was the better of the two, a hundred times better, daintier, prouder, more noble. I was surprised at my observation. They were pouring out champagne. I held my glass up to the queen, and, with a well-turned compliment, I drank to her health. I could see that she felt inclined to hide her head in her napkin. Then, as she was dipping her lips in the clear wine, everybody cried, The queen drinks! The queen drinks! She almost turned purple and choked. Everybody was laughing, but I could see that all loved her. As soon as dinner was over, Chantal took me by the arm. It was time for his cigar, a sacred hour. When alone, he would smoke it out in the street. When guests came to dinner, he would take them to the billiard room and smoke while playing. That evening they had built a fire to celebrate Twelfth Night. My old friend took his cue, a very fine one, and chalked it with great care. Then he said, You break, my boy. He called me my boy, although I was twenty-five, but he had known me as a young child. I started the game and made a few caroms. I missed some others, but as the thought of Mademoiselle Pearl kept returning to my mind, I suddenly asked, 
By the way, Monsieur Chantal, is Mademoiselle Pearl a relative of yours? Greatly surprised, he stopped playing and looked at me. What? Don't you know? Haven't you heard about Mademoiselle Pearl? No. Didn't your father ever tell you? No. Well, well, that's funny. That certainly is funny. Why, it's a regular romance. He paused and then continued. And if you only knew how peculiar it is that you should ask me that today on Twelfth Night. Why? Why? Well, listen. Forty-one years ago today, the day of the Epiphany, the following events occurred. We were then living at Wally le tour on the ramparts, but in order that you may understand, I must first explain the house. Wally is built on a hill, or rather, on a mound which overlooks a great stretch of prairie. We had a house there with a beautiful hanging garden supported by the old battlemented wall, so that the house was in the town on the streets, while the garden overlooked the plain. There was a door leading from the garden to the open country, at the bottom of a secret stairway in the thick wall, the kind you read about in novels. A road passed in front of this door, which was provided with a big bell, for the peasants, in order to avoid the roundabout way, would bring their provisions up this way. You now understand the place, don't you? Well, this year at Epiphany it had been snowing for a week. One might have thought that the world was coming to an end. When we went to the ramparts to look over the plain, this immense white frozen country, which shone like varnish, would chill our very souls. One might have thought that the Lord had packed the world in cotton to put it away in the storeroom for old worlds. I can assure you that it was dreary looking. We were a very numerous family at that time, my father, my mother, my uncle and aunt, my two brothers and four cousins. They were pretty little girls. I married the youngest. Of all that crowd, there are only three of us left, my wife and I and my sister-in-law, who lives in Marseille. Sounds, how quickly a family like that dwindles away. I tremble when I think of it. I was fifteen years old then, since I am fifty-six now. We were going to celebrate the Epiphany, and we were all happy, very happy. Everybody was in the parlor, awaiting dinner, and my oldest brother, Jacques, said, There has been a dog howling out in the plain for about ten minutes. The poor beast must be lost. He had hardly stopped talking when the garden bell began to ring. It had the deep sound of a church bell, which made one think of death. A shiver ran through everybody. My father called the servant and told him to go outside and look. We waited in complete silence. We were thinking of the snow which covered the ground. When the old man returned, he declared that he had seen nothing. The dog kept up its ceaseless howling, and always from the same spot. We sat down to dinner, but we were all uneasy, especially the young people. Everything went well up to the roast. Then the bell began to ring again, three times in succession. Three heavy, long strokes which vibrated to the tips of our fingers and which stopped our conversation short. We sat there looking at each other, fork in the air, still listening, and shaken by a kind of supernatural fear. At last my mother spoke. It's surprising that they should have waited so long to come back. Do not go alone, Baptiste. One of these gentlemen will accompany you. My uncle Francois arose. He was a kind of Hercules, very proud of his strength, and feared nothing in the world. My father said to him, Take a gun, there is no telling what it might be. But my uncle only took a cane and went out with the servant. We others remained there, trembling with fear and apprehension, without eating or speaking. My father tried to reassure us. Just wait and see, he said. It will be some beggar or some traveler lost in the snow. After ringing once, seeing that the door was not immediately opened, he attempted again to find his way, and being unable to, he has returned to our door. Our uncle seemed to stay away an hour. At last he came back furious, swearing. Nothing at all. It's some practical joker. There is nothing but that damn dog howling away at about a hundred yards from the walls. If I had taken a gun, I would have killed him to make him keep quiet. We sat down to dinner again. But everyone was excited. We felt that all was not over, that something was going to happen, that the bell would soon ring again. It rang just as the twelfth night cake was being cut. All the men jumped up together. My uncle, Francois, who had been drinking champagne, swore so furiously that he would murder it, whatever it might be, that my mother and my aunt threw themselves on him to prevent his going. My father, although very calm and a little helpless, he limped ever since he had broken his leg when thrown by a horse, declared in turn that he wished to find out what was the matter and that he was going. My brothers, aged eighteen and twenty, ran to get their guns, and as no one was paying any attention to me, I snatched up a little rifle that was used in the garden and got ready to accompany the expedition. It started out immediately. My father and uncle were walking ahead with Baptiste, who was carrying a lantern. My brothers, Jacques and Paul, followed, and I trailed on behind in spite of the prayers of my mother, who stood in front of the house with her sister and my cousins. It had been snowing again for the last hour, and the trees were weighted down. The pines were bending under this heavy white garment, and looked like white pyramids or enormous sugar cones, 
and through the great curtains of small, hurrying flakes could be seen the lighter bushes, which stood out pale in the shadow. The snow was falling so thick that we could hardly see ten feet ahead of us, but the lantern threw a bright light around us. When we began to go down the winding stairway in the wall, I grew really frightened. I felt as though someone were walking behind me, were going to grab me by the shoulders and carry me away, and I felt a strong desire to return. But, as I would have had to cross the garden all alone, I did not dare. I heard someone opening the door leading to the plane. My uncle began to swear again, exclaiming, "'By God, he has gone again! If I can catch sight of even his shadow, I'll take care not to miss him, the swine!' It was a discouraging thing to see this great expanse of plain, or rather, to feel it before us, for we could not see it. We could only see a thick, endless veil of snow, above, below, opposite us, to the right, to the left, everywhere. My uncle continued, "'Listen, there is the dog howling again. I will teach him how I shoot. That will be something gained anyhow.' But my father, who was kind-hearted, went on, "'It will be much better to go on and get the poor animal who is crying for hunger,' The poor fellow is barking for help. He is calling like a man in distress. Let us go to him. So we started out through the mist, through this thick continuous fall of snow, which filled the air, which moved, floated, fell, and chilled the skin with a burning sensation like a sharp, rapid pain as each flake melted. We were sinking in up to our knees in this soft, cold mass, and we had to lift our feet very high in order to walk. As we advanced, the dog's voice became clearer and stronger. My uncle cried, Here he is! We stopped to observe him as one does when he meets an enemy at night. I could see nothing, so I ran up to the others, and I caught sight of him. He was frightful and weird-looking. He was a big black shepherd's dog with long hair and a wolf's head, standing just within the gleam of light cast by our lantern on the snow. He did not move. He was silently watching us. My uncle said, "'That's peculiar. He is neither advancing nor retreating. I feel like taking a shot at him.' My father answered in a firm voice, no, we must capture him. Then my brother Jacques added, But he's not alone. There is something behind him. There was indeed something behind him, something gray, impossible to distinguish. We started out again cautiously. When he saw us approaching, the dog sat down. He did not look wicked. Instead, he seemed pleased at having been able to attract the attention of someone. My father went straight to him and petted him. The dog licked his hands. We saw that he was tied to the wheel of a little carriage, a sort of toy carriage, entirely wrapped up in three or four woolen blankets. We carefully took off these coverings, and as Baptiste approached his lantern to the front of this little vehicle, which looked like a rolling kennel, we saw in it a little baby sleeping peacefully. We were so astonished that we couldn't speak. My father was the first to collect his wits, and as he had a warm heart and a broad mind, he stretched his hand over the roof of the carriage and said, "'Poor little waif, you shall be one of us.' and he ordered my brother Jacques to roll the foundling ahead of us. Thinking out loud, my father continued, Some child of love whose poor mother rang at my door on the night of this epiphany in memory of the child of God. He once more stopped and called at the top of his lungs through the night to the four corners of the heavens. We have found it! Then, putting his hand on his brother's shoulder, he murmured, What if you had shot the dog, Francois? My uncle did not answer, but in the darkness he crossed himself for, notwithstanding his blustering manner, he was very religious. The dog, which had been untied, was following us. Ah, but you should have seen us when we got to the house. At first we had a lot of trouble in getting the carriage up through the winding stairway, but we succeeded and even rolled it into the vestibule. How funny Mama was! How happy and astonished! And my four little cousins, the youngest was only six, they looked like four chickens around a nest. At last we took the child from the carriage. It was still sleeping. It was a girl about six weeks old. In its clothes we found ten thousand francs in gold. Yes, my boy, ten thousand francs, which Papa saved for her dowry. Therefore it was not a child of poor people, but perhaps the child of some noble woman in the little bourgeois of the town. Or, again, we made a thousand suppositions, but we never found out anything, never the slightest clue. The dog himself was recognized by no one. He was the stranger in the country. At any rate, the person who rang three times at our door must have known my parents well, to have chosen them thus." That is how, at the age of six weeks, Mademoiselle Pearl entered the Chantal household. It was not until later that she was called Mademoiselle Pearl. She was at first baptized Marie Simone Claire, Claire being intended for her family name. I can assure you that our return to the dining room was amusing, with this baby now awake and looking round her at these people and these lights, with her vague blue questioning eyes. We sat down to dinner again and the cake was cut. I was king, and for queen I took Mademoiselle Pearl, just as you did today. On that day, she did not appreciate the honor that was being shown her. Well, the child was adopted and brought up in the family. 
She grew and the years flew by. She was so gentle and loving and minded so well that everyone would have spoiled her abominably had not my mother prevented it. My mother was an orderly woman with a great respect for class distinctions. She consented to treat little Claire as she did her own sons. But, nevertheless, she wished the distance which separated us to be well marked and our positions well established. Therefore, as soon as the child could understand, she acquainted her with her story and gently, even tenderly, impressed on the little one's mind that for the Chantals she was an adopted daughter, taken in, but nevertheless, a stranger. Claire understood the situation with peculiar intelligence and with surprising instinct. She knew how to take the place which was allotted to her, and to keep it with so much tact, gracefulness, and gentleness that she often brought tears to my father's eyes. My mother herself was often moved by her passionate gratitude and timid devotion of this dainty and loving little creature that she began calling her my daughter. At times, when the little one had done something kind and good, my mother would raise her spectacles on her forehead, a thing which always indicated emotion with her, and she would repeat, This child is a pearl, a perfect pearl. This name stuck to the little Claire, who became and remained for us Mademoiselle Pearl. Monsieur Chantal stopped. He was sitting on the edge of the billiard table, his feet hanging, and was playing with the ball with his left hand, while with his right he crumpled a rag which served to rub the chalk marks from the slate. A little red in the face, his voice thick, he was talking away to himself now, lost in his memories, gently drifting through old scenes and events which awoke in his mind, just as we walk through old family gardens where we were brought up and where each tree, each walk, each hedge reminds us of some occurrence. I stood opposite him, leaning against the wall, my hands resting on my idle cue. After a slight pause, he continued. By Jove, she was pretty at eighteen, and graceful, and perfect. Ah, oh, she was so sweet, and good and true, and charming. She had such eyes, blue transparent, clear, such eyes as I have never seen since. He was once more silent. I asked, why did she never marry? He answered, not to me, but to the word marry which had caught his ear. Why? Why? She never would. She never would. She had a dowry of thirty thousand francs, and she received several offers, but she never would. She seemed sad at that time. That was when I married my cousin, little Charlotte, my wife, to whom I had been engaged for six years. I looked at Monsieur Chantal, and it seemed to me that I was looking into his very soul, and I was suddenly witnessing one of those humble and cruel tragedies of honest, straightforward, blameless hearts, one of those secret tragedies known to no one, not even the silent and resigned victims. A rash curiosity suddenly impelled me to exclaim, "'You should have married her, Monsieur Chantal.' He started, looked at me, and said, "'I? Marry whom?' "'Mademoiselle Pearl.' "'Why?' "'Because you loved her more than your cousin.' He stared at me with strange, round, bewildered eyes and stammered, "'I loved her? I? How? Who told you that?' "'Why, anyone can see that, and it's even on account of her that you delayed for so long your marriage to your cousin.' who had been awaiting you for six years. He dropped the ball which he was holding in his left hand, and, seizing the chalk rag in both hands, he buried his face in it and began to sob. He was weeping with his eyes, nose, and mouth in a heartbreaking yet ridiculous manner, like a sponge which one squeezes. He was coughing, spitting, and blowing his nose in the chalk rag, wiping his eyes and sneezing. Then the tears would begin to flow down the wrinkles on his face, and he would make a strange gurgling noise in his throat. I felt bewildered, ashamed, I wanted to run away, and I no longer knew what to say, do, or attempt. Suddenly, Madame Chantal's voice sounded on the stairs. Haven't you finished smoking your cigars? I opened the door and cried, Yes, Madame, we are coming right down. Then I rushed to her husband, and seizing him by the shoulders, I cried, Monsieur Chantal, my friend Chantal, listen to me. Your wife is calling. Pull yourself together. We must go downstairs. He stammered, Yes, yes, I'm coming, poor girl. I'm coming. Tell her that I am coming. He began conscientiously to wipe his face on the cloth, which, for the last two or three years, had been used for marking off the chalk from the slate. Then he appeared, half white and half red, his forehead, nose, cheeks, and chin covered with chalk, and his eyes swollen, still full of tears. I caught him by the hands and dragged him into his bedroom, muttering, I beg your pardon, I beg your pardon, Monsieur Chantal, for having caused you such sorrow, but I did not know. You, you understand. He squeezed my hand, saying, Yes, yes, there are difficult moments. Then he plunged his face into a bowl of water. When he emerged from it, he did not yet seem to me to be presentable, but I thought of a little stratagem. As he was growing worried, looking at himself in the mirror, I said to him, All you have to do is say that a little dust flew into your eye, and you can cry before everybody to your heart's content. He went downstairs, rubbing his eyes with his handkerchief. 
all were worried. Each one wished to look for the speck, which could not be found, and stories were told of similar cases where it had been necessary to call a physician. I went over to Mademoiselle Pearl and watched her, tormented by an ardent curiosity, which was turning to positive suffering. She must indeed have been pretty, with her gentle, calm eyes, so large that it looked as though she never closed them, like other mortals. Her gown was a little ridiculous, a real old maid's gown, which was unbecoming without appearing clumsy. It seemed to me as though I were looking into her soul, just as I had into Monsieur Chantal's, that I was looking right from one end to the other of this humble life, so simple and devoted. I felt an irresistible longing to question her, to find out whether she too had loved him, whether she also had suffered, as he had, from this long, secret, poignant grief, which one cannot see, know, or guess, but which breaks forth at night in the loneliness of the dark room. I was watching her, and I could observe her heart beating under her waist, and I wondered whether this sweet, candid face had wept on the soft pillow, and she had sobbed, her whole body shaken by the violence of her anguish. I said to her in a low voice, like a child who is breaking a toy to see what is inside, If you could have seen Monsieur Chantal crying a while ago, it would have moved you. She started, asking, What? He was weeping? Ah, oh, yes, he was indeed weeping. Why? She seemed deeply moved. I answered, On your account. On my account. Yes, he was telling me how much she had loved you in the days gone by, and what a pang it had given him to marry his cousin instead of you. Her pale face seemed to grow a little longer. Her calm eyes, which always remained open, suddenly closed so quickly that they seemed shut forever. She slipped from her chair to the floor, and slowly, gently sank down as would a fallen garment. I cried, Help! Help! Mademoiselle Pearl is ill! Madame Chantal and her daughters rushed forward, and while they were looking for towels, water, and vinegar, I grabbed my hat and ran away. I walked away with rapid strides, my heart heavy, my mind full of remorse and regret, and yet sometimes I felt pleased. I felt as though I had done a praiseworthy and necessary act. I was asking myself, did I do wrong or right? They had that shut up in their hearts, just as some people carry a bullet in a closed wound. Will they not be happier now? It was too late for their torture to begin over again, and early enough for them to remember it with tenderness. And perhaps some evening next spring, moved by a beam of moonlight falling through the branches on the grass at their feet, they will join and press their hands in memory of all the cruel and suppressed suffering, and perhaps also this short embrace may infuse in their veins a little of this thrill which they would not have known without it, and will give to those two dead souls, brought to life in a second, the rapid and divine sensation of this intoxication, of this madness which gives to lovers more happiness in an instant than other men can gather in their whole lifetime. End of section 56. Recording by Tatiana Chichilla, Columbus, Ohio.